Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of this workshop. Uh, let me introduce Miguel Abreu from Instituto Superior Técnico, and his talk is on contact invariance of Gorenstein to toric contact manifolds, the Hergert polynomial, and Shen Huang cohomology. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to come again to Rio and speak at this workshop. Uh, <coughs> this, this morning uh, at breakfast at the top floor of the hotel, the sun is out and I took some pictures of the view. I sent them home and of course uh, my kids and my wife could not believe that I was going to be working. So. <laughs> I'd like to ask Leonardo, please take a picture <laughs> during the talk, <laughs> so that uh, I'm, I'm serious, OK? Do take a picture whenever you think it's appropriate, so that then I can take, uh, send that home and show that I did come here to do some mathematics. OK, so I'll, uh, I'll talk about contact manifolds. And yesterday, they didn't show up, although I think almost everybody here knows what a contact manifold is. but. For the record, and since these uh, talks are filmed, and uh, maybe some student later on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just say a little bit. So contact manifolds are odd dimensional manifolds. And in this talk, they will almost always have dimension 2n plus 1. And they are equipped with a co-dimension 1 hyperplane field on the, on the, of the tangent bundle, a sub-bundle of co-dimension one of the tangent bundle, which is maximally non-integrable, which means, which means that it can be expressed as the kernel of a one-form alpha. And <clears throat> this form alpha satisfies the condition that alpha wedge the alpha to the n, which is a top uh, form on this 2n plus 1 dimensional manifold, is always is a volume form, so it's never zero. It's an and uh, <clears throat> another thing is that <clears throat> see this hyperplane field equipped with this form alpha is a symplectic vector bundle, and so it has a first chain class which will also appear. So these contact manifolds come with a first chain class, a cohomology class. And um, another thing that it's important about these contact manifolds is that <coughs> associated to every time you pick a one form alpha for which the contact distribution is, the, is its kernel, <coughs> you can um, associate to it a vector field called the rev vector field. Which we unique, uniquely characterize by the fact that sits in the kernel of alpha, and that alpha evaluated with it, so we normalize it so that alpha evaluated on it is equal to 1. So contact manifolds appear naturally in several uh, circumstances, some of which will appear in the talk. They are <coughs> a structure that a, a convex boundary of a symplectic domain naturally has. They also appear as, as a, a structures on the link of isolated singularities, complex singularities. They can also be obtained as something called, and I'll talk about it, the prequantization construction over a symplectic manifold. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, um, and they have also this, the, the, the flow of this rev vector field or of these rev vector fields that have plenty of vector fields uh, associated with such a thing, because if you take a positive function on your manifold m, then f times alpha is another contact form, and you have a new vector field, new rev vector field, whose dynamics can be quite different from the one associated with alpha. And these rev flows and dynamical properties of the rev flows are important things to study. For example, <coughs> Uh, contact manifolds also arise as the unit cosphere bundles of remaining manifolds. 
And the red flows in that situation are examples of um, geodesic flows on the, on the remaining manifold. And one of the things that one likes to understand is to extract information about the all possible red flows that you have on a contact manifold, say, for example, the number of closed periodic orbits that necessarily need to exist on these contact manifolds just from properties of the contact structure underlying these red flows. And this talk will be a little bit about uh, this, this type of invariance. OK, but I'll, in this talk, I'll be discussing a very special class of, toric, of contact manifolds called toric contact manifolds. So these toric contact manifolds, they are contact manifolds that have a big torus acting by symmetries on your contact manifold. So this torus has maximal possible dimension for such a contact manifold. And another way of expressing this property of having a torus is that saying that the simplectization of the contact manifold, which is, <coughs> oh, I didn't talk about simplectization. So associated, I won't say much about simplectization. Let me just say that the simplectization of a contact manifold sits inside as a symplectic submanifold of the cotangent bundle of the, of the, of the contact manifold. <coughs> and uh, so it inher inherits a, symplectic, a natural symplectic structure. And these, the, the torus action lifts to this symplectization. And this symplectic manifold equipped with this, this torus action is a toric symplectic manifold, a, a very special one. It's a toric symplectic cone. So in this symplectization, you have an R action, and the torus commutes with that R action. So these are very special uh, contact manifolds. And they all arise, the ones I'm looking at, they all arise as contact reductions of the standard contact structure on the sphere. OK? And <clears throat> how do you do that? If you consider the sphere, the sphere is a uh, odd-dimensional sphere inside CD, is a, a standard example of a contact manifold. It, it comes with the torus. The, the standard torus TD acting on CD by rotations on each factor acts on this, on this contact manifold. So it's an example of a toric contact manifold. And you can do what's called contact reduction, which is the analog of symplectic reduction. And how you do contact reduction? You have to pick some subtorus inside your torus TD. And that subtorus arises as the kernel of an uh, of a homomorphism from this torus TD to a torus Tn plus 1, where n is, again, the n that appears in the dimension of the contact toric manifold that you want to obtain. So <clears throat> the, the data that you need to construct such a toric, contact toric manifold is a map from Td to Tn plus 1. And a map like that is determined by where the basis vectors of Td go in Tn plus 1. And so that is these d vectors integral vectors in Zn plus 1 with some properties. But if you are given d integral vectors in Zn plus 1, you use them as the images of the standard basis vectors of Td minus 1, of Td, sorry. And you get that map beta. The kernel of that map will be what you are going to do, the, the, the subtorus that you are going to use to do symplectic reduction, which I'm not going to explain what it is. Anyway, these vectors, which are the data you need, are also <coughs> have also an interpretation as the normals to the moment map image of the symplectization. The cone, which is the moment map image of the symplectization acted on by these torus. So the situation is the following. You have your toric contact manifold. You look at the symplectization of it. It comes equipped with an action of the torus. And the Hamiltonian functions that generate the action of the torus give you a map to Rn plus 1, whose image is a convex polyhedral cone like this one. And this convex polyhedral cone that I'm denoting by C is determined by some facets that go through the origin. And these facets are determined by the normals to the facets, which are primitive integral vectors. 
And these facets turn out exactly to be those vectors that I was talking about there. OK? Now, I, in the title is the word Gorenstein. It's kind of a fancy word for saying I'm looking at toric contact manifolds with zero first chain class. And zero first chain class, in terms of the description, can be characterized by the fact that these normals lie in an hyperplane inside an integral hyperplane inside Rn plus 1. That means that up to a change of basis, which I will do, we can assume that all these vectors have the last coordinate 1. And the first n coordinates are a vector in, R, in Zn, which I'm calling Vj. OK? So the normals have n components Vj, and the last one is 1. And every time you have a moment cone, whose normals can be put in this condition, you are talking about a toric contact manifold with zero first chain class. And <clears throat> so let me write this. So these normals. So this guy lives in Zn, while the whole thing lives in Zn plus 1. And now I said that those normals need to satisfy some conditions so that what, what you are constructing is a smooth contact manifold. And that condition is that one way of expressing it is that if you plot these vectors, Vs, which live in Zn. Here I'm drawing them in Z2, sitting in R2. And you look at the convex hull of these vectors. <coughs> that is a convex polytope that has the following property. Each facet. Of, its, of this polytope, its co-dimension one phase, has to be a fine NZ equivalent to the convex hull of the standard basis vectors in Rn or Zn. So in this case, for example, that means that each facet of this polytope has, has to be a fine NZ equivalent to the convex hull of the vectors E1 and E2 in R2. And every time you have such a thing, Every time you have an integral convex polytope whose facets are a fine NZ equivalent to the convex hull of the stand, to the simplex given by the convex hull of the standard basis vectors, you say that such a thing is a toric diagram. And a toric diagram gives rise through this backwards construction to a contact, smooth toric contact manifold of dimension n plus 1. And so the notation I'll use is that D, which is a toric diagram in Rn, gives rise to some toric contact manifold, Md, with contact structure Cd. Let me give some examples. So here I'll use the mouse a little bit. So the first example, which generalizes um, easily in higher dimensions, is the sphere. And... <coughs> So suppose your toric diagram <coughs> is this standard simplex in R2, which is the convex hull of the vectors 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1. So these are the vectors I'm calling uh, V3, it's the 0, 0, V1, it's the 1, 0, and V2, it's the 0, 1. Okay? So this is a picture that you should think of as sitting in the Lie algebra of the torus. Then you add 1 to the last coordinate of all of them, and you draw and you look at them now as normals to a cone in the dual of the Lie algebra. That's where the moment map lives. And that is the moment cone associated to some contact toric manifold. In this case, that toric manifold is the standard five sphere, five sphere with the standard contact structure. And let me point out that normally when we talk about toric contact manifolds or toric manifolds or toric sympathetic manifolds, you are always looking at the moment map image. The polytopes normally are the image of the moment map. 
And the image of the moment map here in this, in this uh, contact setting is this cone. The diagram lives in the Lie algebra and has vertices, the normals, to the moment cone. OK? And the diagram will play a more important role in this talk than the moment map image itself. But a priori, this diagram is just a combinatorial gadget to put the normals, to, com to encode the information of the normals to the cone. This is a more geometric thing because this is really the image. In that case, the image of the simplectization of the sphi five sphere under the moment map. Of course, in this case, the simplectization of the five sphere is just R6 minus the origin. And this is the moment map image of the standard uh, three torus action there. Now let me draw here a different diagram. This is an example that, we'll, uh, that we will use throughout the whole talk. That's a slightly different uh, diagram. I just move this origin 0, 0 to the point minus 1, minus 1. So now I have a new toric diagram, which has an integral point inside, which is the point 0, 0. That's what I'm drawing there. But the, norm, the, the vertices are just these three vectors, minus 1, minus 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1. So if you add 1 to the last coordinate, you look at those three vectors now as the normals to some moment cone in R3, and here is the moment cone. I tried to make this picture so that it would be like what happened to that picture if this third normal became, instead of 0, 0, 1, which is the vertical, it will be minus 1, minus 1, 1. So that means that, that this facet here, which is kind of an horizontal plane, lifts, goes up a little bit. So that's uh, what this is. And what, what kind of uh, manifold is this? It's just the quotient. If you go through the construction, it's just the quotient of S5 by a, a, a Z3 diagonal action. Okay, so it's a length space. It's a five-dimensional length space with order of fundamental group 3. And weight of the action is just 1, 1, 1 in all coordinates. Okay? And this, this, this example will uh, go through the whole talk. Here is <coughs> another example that I always show because it was really the example that I think uh, kind of more than 10 years ago started me and Leonardo. Oh, shit. So uh, in this, <laughs> okay. So in the, the first slide, um, so I talked about pictures and breakfast and something, and I completely forgot to say <laughs> that everything I'm going to talk about is joint work with Leonardo Macarini um, and also Miguel Moreira. Miguel Moreira is a, a very bright uh, master student that both of us advised in Lisbon. He finished his thesis just uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, and he's going to start his PhD in September at ETH but he's a very, very important part of the results I'll talk about today. So these are joint work with Leonardo Macarini and Miguel Moreira. Sorry, I forgot to say that. I remembered now because more than 10 years ago, uh, <clears throat> this was the example that started us trying to understand contact invariance of toric contact manifolds. And the, this example that I'm describing here was given to us by some <clears throat> mathematical physicists working in the what they call ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, these are Sparks, Waldrum, Gauntlet, and uh, Martelli, four mathematical physicists, which they were constructing some Sasaki-Einstein matrix on some five manifolds. And the Sasaki-Einstein matrix are the contact analog of Kähler matrix in, in the sympathetic setting. So, Underlying those Sasaki-Einstein metrics were some contact manifolds. And the, it turned out they, they were dealing with some contact structures on the fixed five manifold, which was just S2 cross S3. And if you go through the thing, the toric diagram of the contact structures that they were dealing with was, is depicted here. It's just a quadrilateral, which have these three vertices plus one vertex of coordinates PP. And this P is any natural number can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. 
the moment cone associated to the simplectization of that toric contact manifold, I'm trying to depict it here, is a cone in R3. We are seeing it from inside. And the normals are just these three, four guys with one in the last corner. So it's this thing. And it turns out that <coughs> these are contact structures on S2 cross S3 parameterized by a natural number P. And I'll come back to them. By the way, the, for P equals to 1, this contact structure is the standard contact structure on the unit cos sphere bundle of S3. OK, so that's the first, the first point of the fun. OK, now let's <coughs> talk a bit uh, about um, contact invariance. So this stands for cylindrical contact homology, but let me tell you how we are going to address it. So <clears throat> so one starts with a toric diagram, which will give And think of it, so this guy sits in Zn, actually Rn, but this Rn sits in the Lie algebra of the torus Tn plus 1 as an hyperplane in Rn plus 1, the hyperplane given, given by the last coordinate being, being equal to 1. OK, so if you pick any point in the Lie algebra of the torus, gives rise to a vector field on your contact manifold because the torus acts on the contact manifold. So if you have a vector in the Lie algebra, you look at the vector field associated, induced by the action through that vector in the Lie algebra, and you get a vector field on your uh, toric contact manifold. It turns out, and this was first noticed or mentioned by two of these mathematical physicists that I talked about before, plus Yao in a paper of 2006, they noticed that which, which of these vector fields uh, um, arise as rep vector fields of contact forms on your contact manifold. In particular, as vector fields of toric contact forms, torus invariant contact forms on your con contact manifold. And it turns out that the points in the algebra that do arise are the points that sit inside the toric diagram. So any point in the interior of the diagram gives rise to a vector field that turns out to be the rev vector field for an appropriate contact form, toric contact form on this contact manifold. And so this toric diagram, which was just in the beginning just a combinatorial gadget to encode the construction of a toric contact manifold, in its interior also parameterizes the normalized, because of course it parameterizes because I pick a point here in the interior, I'm calling the coordinates of this point R1 through Rn. And then the rep vector field is a vector field associated with a vector in the Lie algebra with last coordinate 1. So I'm normalizing the rep vector fields up to a scale. I put in the last coordinate 1. And then I have some vector field on my toric contact manifold, which is the rep vector field for some torus invariant contact form. And these are the vector fields that we will use to define this uh, contact events that will appear now. So, <clears throat> so th in that original work that started us on this thing, we, we noticed the following. So this vector field is non-degenerate in the sense that all of its closed orbits are non-degenerate if and only if these RJs, those coordinates, are irrational and rationally dependent. So this is the condition, oh, sorry, yes, are irrational and rationally dependent. So this is the condition for what? So these are vector fields, a vector field in the Lie algebra of the torus. And if that condition is satisfied, it generates in the torus a, a dense one parameter subgroup of the torus. So the flow on your contact manifold will mimic this dense one parameter subgroup of the torus. So in all, wherever the torus acts freely on your toric contact manifold, the flow will be a dense flow on that torus orbit. And, and so, <coughs> and let me help you a little bit with the picture. So now I'm drawing a moment cone. 
the moment map image. <coughs> and this happens for uh, toric sympathetic manifolds. So that, there is a, here a, a contact manifold. Or its simplectization. The contact manifold we maps to some level set here. And then this is the, the simplectization. And as happens for, uh, as it happens for uh, uh, toric sympathetic manifolds, interior points, the pre-image of interior points of the moment cone are, to, are, are points where the action of the torus is free. So the pre-image of interior points are full orbits of the torus Tn plus 1. And so the flow there is dense. No periodic orbits there. Now, if you go to a facet, in this case, in this three-dimensional picture, if you go to a facet and look at the pre-image by the moment map, what you get is that one circle collapsed and the orbit here is a T2. But still, it's a two-dimensional torus. You have a kind of an irrational flow on this two-dimensional torus, dense, no periodic orbits. But if you go to an edge of the cone, the pre-image now, two tori collapsed. Two the pre-image is just a circle inside your torus. And of course, a dense rotation of the circle is still a rotation of the circle, and you have a closed periodic orbit of your flow. And so the periodic orbits of these uh, <coughs> type of rev vector fields, where these coordinates are irrational and rationally dependent, are exactly the pre-images of the edges of the cone or of the vertices of this cone of this cut that corresponds to the contact menu. So you have, well, <coughs> and it turns out that <coughs> in terms of toric diagram, now what is the toric diagram of this thing? The, now the toric diagram is something like this in this case, where now these guys are the normals to this one, and these vertices here correspond to the facets of the toric diagram. So you have one periodic orbit for each facet of the toric diagram. So the simplest, cl simple closed rev orbits for such a rev vector field are in one-to-one -one correspondence to the facets, in this case, these three facets of the toric diagram. And so they are finitely many. You just denote them by gamma 1, gamma m. m. So non-degenerate means that these orbits are non-degenerate, so the linearized map is, uh, around it is non-degenerate. And one of the things is you can, because these manifolds are very special, they are obtained a symplectic reduction of the standard sphere. They are, the symplectization is obtained as a symplectic reduction of CD, which is a linear space. So you kind of can lift all the computations you need to do here to some computations in CD that can be done explicitly. And it turns out that the degree of such orbits, or of the iterates, which is defined, so here I'm using the degree as the kind of sympathetic field theory degree, so it's the Conley Zender index of the orbit plus n minus 2. Okay? And this Conley Zender index is an index that measures the twisting of the, of the linearized map around the orbit. I'm not going to say more about that. But the main point of this line here is that we can show that this degree is always an even, no negative number. Okay? So, first of all, in the beginning we just proved it was even, but then with a little bit more, you can prove that it's, and we'll see that it's no negative, so it's a no negative, <coughs> even integer. So, that means that <coughs> uh, I'm not going to say more about that, but you know that this uh, you know, contact homology, oscillating contact homology, if defined, or if well defined, <coughs> is an homology that whose generators are these uh, closed periodic orbits. And then you have uh, graded by that degree, which is an even integer. And then you'll have a boundary map that, uh, whose square is 0 and would give you an homology out of it. Because the degrees are all even, the boundary map is automatically zero. And so if um, life is fair and everything works out well, the 
essentially the orbits give you the generators of your moment. Okay? And so, uh, for example, the number of closed R new orbits with degree K should be the rank of the cylinder contact homology of degree K. So let me call that number CBK, which is for contact Betty number. The contact Betty number of degree K should be exactly the number of closed orbits that you have of degree K, and that should be a contact invariant. It should be the rank of the cylinder contact homology, contact Betty number. Okay, but of course the cyl uh, cylindrical contact homology and these things have some issues about transversality that makes them not always, one cannot guarantee always that these are well-defined invariants. But in the context of this talk, I can say that these are really well-defined invariants uh, using equivalent symplectic homology, of positive equivalent symplectic homology, based, for example, on recent work of McLean and uh, Ritter. I think uh, Ritter is going to talk about it next, a little bit. And uh, which in, in itself was based in previous work by Kwon and Van Kort. But so, which in, for the historic context would say that these are really invariants, okay, at least one when the historic contact manifold has a crepant, meaning first chain class zero, toric symplectic feeling. Okay? And I'll discuss a little bit about these feelings, crepant feelings later. But that's always true when n equals two. So when n equals two, the historic contact manifolds always have crepant toric symplectic feelings. And so when n equals two, see, meaning for these five dimensional manifolds I'm talking about, these are really uh, invariants of, uh, of your contact structure. And in other situations also, but for the context of this talk, this will be the, the thing. Uh, what happened here? Ah, when n equals 2. Yeah, that's the last line. Okay. So the notation, I had the notation where this CB depended on, on the red vector field I took, but now... Under these circumstances, it does not depend. It just depends on the toric diagram. And actually, it is a contact invariant of the contact structure, not just of the toric contact structure, of the contact structure, at least in this. OK, so now let's go to the, so this is already half an hour. I'm glad that I, I thought about giving this talk on the blackboard. So I, I, I he made a rehearsal of that, and it took me one hour and a half. So then I realized, well, let me just draw, write this and. Uh, Hopefully, I'll reach the end. Anyway, <clears throat> OK, so first results of uh, myself, Leonardo, and, and uh, Miguel Moreira. Let's, I'm going to relate these contact Betty numbers with the Herhardt, Herhardt polynomial of the toric diagram. So the Herhardt polynomial is something that encodes the number of integral points of a polytope and its scalings. Another way of defining it is that the Herhardt polynomial of a diagram D at, at T, where T is a positive integer, is just the number of integral points, or the number of points in the intersection of the toric diagram with the lattice Zn rescaled by 1 over T. So number of rational points with denominator T inside the toric diagram. So this is an object which is very, very studied in combinatorics of toric poly. And it turns out that it is a polynomial. So it is a polynomial of degree n, whose coefficients, let me call them ck of d, if you write them in the standard basis of polynomials, 1, t, t squared, t cubed, etc. So <clears throat> it's a monic polynomial, so c0 is 1. And the leading term of this degree n polynomial is the volume, the Euclidean volume of the toric type. Now, if you write it in a different basis, in the base is given by these combinatorial functions, combinatorial, how do you call these? these um, yeah, combinatorial factors. I know, these bases of polynomials that are t plus n minus square choose n, so some factorials here. Then the coefficients are called the de delta coefficients. Turn out, and that's a result of Stanley in these combinatorics, turn out to be always non-negative integers. So they are integers greater or equal than zero. And these are, for us, will play a more important role than those ones. They arise more naturally. And so the theorem is that actually these delta numbers, which are greater or equal than zero, are exactly the difference 
between two consecutive contact betting numbers of your toric manifold. Okay? So the, to the contact betting numbers are always, e the degree is always even. We have nothing in our degree. And the difference between two consecutive ones, 2k and 2k minus 1, is exactly the coefficient delta n minus k of d. So in a way, this result shows, this combinatorial result that shows that the information that the error polynomial has is exactly the same as the information that the cylindrical contact homology has in this, in this, in this context. Uh, and this is, so as I said, we have, we can kind of combinatorially compute indices of these rev orbits that arise from these uh, irrational rev vector fields. The thing is that the formula, of course, you can. Given one, I can compute everything. But how, what is the meaning of the numbers that we get? And if, in this, in this, in this context, if you look at what's going on, and you look at how the Erhard polynomial arises, once you think of relating the two things, it's not too hard. There are some computations involved. But to see that this, this thing happens, which is kind of a cute, uh, I think, observation. In particular, here are a corollary that <coughs> just from things that people know about these delta coefficients of the error polynomial, we can say about the contact betting numbers of these manifolds. They stabilize after when k is greater or equal than n. They are always equal after k greater or equal than n. So C2n, C2n plus 2, C2n plus 4, they are always equal to n factorial times the volume of the toric diagram. In particular, uh, for example, the mean Euler characteristic of these the toric contact manifolds is given, obviously, by just divide this by 2 because they arise in uh, every two indices. So it's n factorial over 2 times the volume of this. So we had, so two years ago in this, in this conference, I talked about exactly this result, that the mean Euler characteristic was the, given by the n factorial over 2 times the volume of the toric diagram. And in that case, uh, we had a direct proof of that, which I also like quite a bit, which is just the following. If you look at the rev vector field, which is a point in the interior of the toric diagram, and subdivide now the toric diagram, Look, the central subdivision of the historic diagram like this. And it turns out that, so here remember that facets correspond to orbits. So here you have one orbit. You can think of one orbit here. Here you have another orbit. And here you have another orbit. And it turns out that this area is 1 over the mean index of this orbit. This area is 1 over the mean index of this orbit. And this area is 1 over the mean index of this orbit. And then you use a resonance relation of Victor Gisburg and uh, um, Bashak Gurel, I think it's, uh, and also your student. Eli Kerman. The, the, the resonance relation is? Gisburg, uh, Victor Gisburg and Eli Kerman, which says that the sum of 1 over the mean indexes is exactly equal to the mean Euler characteristic. So you see that the sum of these things is just the volume of the toric diagram. But here you see this is a much more detailed thing. You know that actually the, the contact betting numbers stabilize always at the same value. The other thing is that the contact betting number just before stabilization is just the value of the stabilized minus 1. So it just decreases. And just that's because the, the delta coefficient 0 is equal to 1. And another thing which I think is also very cute is that the <coughs> contact betting number, the first one, of degree zero cylindrical contact homology is exactly given by the number of integral points in the interior of the toric diagram. That's exactly, that's just because it's equal to delta n, and delta n is exactly the number of integral points in the, in the interior of the toric diagram. So, <clears throat> as the, an example, so the corollary just implies that you, you can compute all contact betting numbers for five dimensional toric contact manifolds or when the diagram is contained in R2 because, <coughs> um, well, the, the first one is the number of integral points inside. So you look at the toric diagram and see. The, the, the fourth one in f and after that is the volume. And the one before that is the volume minus one. So for that example that I said that we're going to use throughout this talk, which was this... Uh, 
land space. So you get that the contact Betty numbers. So you have degree 0, degree 2, degree 4, degree 6. <coughs> they start as 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 3, all the way. Let me write that here, just from the toric diagram. And this applies to any toric diagram, two-dimensional toric diagram, or any toric five, contact toric five manifold. Okay. Now, <coughs> Some second part of the results. The relations between these contact Betty numbers and orbifold resolutions of fillings of the um, fillings of the toric contact manifold or resolutions of the singularity that you have in this context at the vertex of the cone associated with your toric contact manifold. So <coughs> in toric geometry, uh, when you, you start with a toric diagram like this, if you look at the triangulation, some, spe some special sort of triangulation of the diagram, you can look at the fan over that, that, that triangulation, and you get a partial resolution of the toric isolated singularity at the vertex of the symplectization. So this is some toric construction that does that. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that always, uh, and I'll illustrate it, that always um, kind of questioned me a little bit was, okay, so out of this, out of this um, toric algebraic geometry, let's say, you, you, you get something like this, you have a triangulation, you get a fun, and you get, you get some algebraic resolution of this, of this uh, singularity at the origin. Now, how can you turn that into a sympletic manifold there? How can you show that there is a sympletic form on this resolution a toric sympletic form on this resolution that gives you some picture on the moment cones realizing this algebraic geometry resolution. So for compact, so the, it, people know, it is known that if such a triangulation of the fun of a triangulation admits something which is called a strictly convex support function, then you can use that support function to construct a sympletic form on this resolution and you get a toric sympletic orbifold with uh, zero function class. And so in the compact setting, this is well known. And the proof turns out to, uh, probably this is also well known in the non-compact setting of these uh, resolutions of uh, singularities. I don't know if Mark knows if this is the fact that you can construct all these sympletic forms on these resolutions uh, is known. But anyway, the proof for the compact setting, one checks and it, turns, it translates exactly to the historic diagrams, triangulations, and you see that you can compu compute, uh, you can construct a strictly convex support function. Out of it, you get a sympathetic form. And then, in other words, every Gorenstein toric contact manifold admits a crepant with C1 equal to zero toric or before sympathetic film. So we, we assume our crepant resolution has a sympathetic field. So we don't prove it. Actually. So we assume that there's a sympathetic field. Okay. But in the historic, setting, which is, uh, we can show that in the historic setting, it does have one if it's an, but you have to allow orbifold singularities. So it's not clear that you, you, it's not always true that you can get a smooth one. Okay, and that me, and let me show you a picture, which I think it's the better thing, because this is, of course, completely uh, cryptic, uh, which is this. Okay, here is a picture that, for that, So remember I talked about these, these original examples as two cross S3 with these contact structures. The moment cone was something with four facets. So seen from inside, it was something like this, okay? With four normals, you see the cone. You are, so the cone is like coming out here, okay? And what this picture is supposed to illustrate is you, here is a triangulation, an integral triangulation of the, of the toric diagram. And associated to this triangulation, I'm drawing here the picture of the resolution of that singularity here at the, at the vertex, okay? 
It's this one. This one corresponds to that triangulation. If you do a different triangulation, you might get a different thing. And what I was talking about that proposition is how out of this triangulation you can pick the position where you put these facets. That triangulation tells you the normals that you are going to add to this thing. But where do you put the facets with respect to the origin so that everything fits well? And you do get, this is a smooth sympathetic manifold in this case, which turns out to be a filling of the contact manifold that you have here at the boundary. You could see here, if you cut and do a cut that corresponds to this, you, that pre-image of that is the toric contact, the contact manifold. Inside, you have the filling. You have your vertices. You have your symplectic spheres. You have here CP2. You have here CP2 blown up at a point. Anyway, you have lots of things that arise there out of that triangulation. Okay. Well, the theorem of uh, Batirev and Daiz in the smooth uh, resolution case from 1996. And then Stapleton has a paper of 2008, which proves it also for the orbifold filling case, says the following. So these orbifolds have an orbifold um, cohomology theory called Shen run cohomology, which I'll mention a little bit what it is. But what this theorem says is that the dimension of the, this orbifold cohomology of the resolution of the singularity is equal to delta j for the degrees 2j and 0 otherwise. So they relate this orbifold cohomology of the filling with those coefficients of the error polynomial. And it says that it's, note that orbifold cohomology in general, it can have rational degrees. And what this says is that actually they are all zero, except for the even integers 2j, and then they are given by the delta j coefficient of the polynomial. So if you combine that with the fact that those delta j coefficients give you the difference in ranking of the cylindrical contact homology, or the contact by numbers, one can state the theorem of this type, that <coughs> this, the Cylindrical contact homology, or in terms of Betty numbers at least, the cylindrical contact homology of the contact toric manifold can be obtained as a direct sum of shifted copies of the orbifold homology, orbifold cohomology of the filling, which can be an orbifold filling of, of the sympathetic, um, the filling of your uh, contact manifold. Okay? When in the smooth case, we can also give kind of a direct proof of that. But actually, this is, uh, so here is where I think how this uh, relates with work of McLean and Ritter, who, well, Ritter will talk about it next, have a similar result for isolated finite conscious singularities, which don't have to be a billion finite conscious singularities. And I think from what I understand that the overlap with this corollary, in, so the only, Finite quotient singularities, which are also toric, are the billion ones, and those give rise to land spaces. So the overlap between the, the two works is the land spaces. They go in a different direction for non-abelian quotient singularities, and this applies to toric singularities at, at, at the vertex. Unfortunately, examples I have because I, uh, uh, not unfortunately, I think they are quite illustrative, but are also examples that I don't know if you are guys, guys are going to use or not because these are land spaces. But, Anyway, here is a, a OK, I have to go quick because I want to talk about that. Here is an example, again, of that five-dimensional that five end space. And here, I'm taking a triangulation that is just the whole toric diagram. I don't triangulate anything. I'm filling with the ball quotient by Z3. So it's a normal filling with a singularity at the origin. So then you have to compute the orbifold cohomology of such a thing. And it turns out the orbifold cohomology has, has a decomposition, which is called the twisted sector decomposition, but it's a decomposition in terms of isotropies of the elements of, of, of fixed points of various elements of the group. So for example, for the identity, you have the fixed point set of the identity is the whole thing. Well, the whole thing is a ball quotient by um, Z3, so that's contractible. So that's the same thing as the homology of a point. And then you have the element one-third and two-thirds. Here I'm, I'm writing the, 
this group Z3 additively. I'm looking at the interval 0, 1, and the identity is 1, and the generator is 1 third, and then 2 thirds, okay? Because that will be helpful for us. And then we have some shifting for the other, for all these components, we have some shifted in degree, which is called by, given by this number, which is the degree shifting number. And for this or before cohomology, the secret is how to compute these degree shifting numbers. And the computations for complicated examples can be very complicated. But anyway, here, what you get is exactly this. And so if you add this whole thing, you get that the orbifold cohomology is just Q in degrees 0, 2, and 4, and 0 otherwise. And so what happened? Am I missing something? I should have a, a, well, I don't have. Anyway, and if you put, in, if you apply that theorem with these or before cohomology and you see it shifts, you, exactly, you get exactly the same result. I think that should be here. Oh, here it is. So the F1 component contributes with the shifting that appears in the theorem with degree one, with rank one in degree four and after, four, six, eight, and so forth. The one third component starts at degree two and then so forth. The degree, uh, the F2 third starts at degree zero and then so forth, just with rank one. And if you add these ranks, you get one, two, three, 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 which is exactly what we have in the other thing, as should be. Okay, but you could also do a triangulation. So I'm clearly going over. So that was one feeling. Now suppose you do triangulate your toric diagram. You use the point here, the origin that you have here, you make this triangulation, and look at what is the feeling or the resolution of the singularity that you get out of this triangulation. And it turns out that it's just, if you, you see the cone, you blow up the cone kind of at the origin, you get here a copy of CP2, and the total space of this thing is just the total space of the line bundle, the canonical or anti-canonical line bundle over CP2. I never know which one it is. So it's either O plus three or minus three over CP2, that's the total space. Now this is a smooth resolution, so the, cohomology of the filling is the usual homology of this thing, which is the homology of CP2, which is, of course, also the same thing that we had before. It has rank 1 in degree 0, degree 2, and degree 4. And this illustrates something that's expected from this orbifold cohomology, is that the orbifold cohomology should be equal to the orbifold, to the usual cohomology of a resolution of the singularity. And here it illustrates that, and of course you are going to get the same thing. Okay, but I need to move on. So as expected, you get same. So that's one nothing. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to finish with the last part, which is um, which is actually, I think, the main result we have, which is the relation between these contact Betty numbers and frequentizations. Now, suppose you have one of these historic contact manifolds and choose, instead of an irrational rev vector field, Choose a rational one, one whose flow is all of periodic orbits. Not necessarily with the same period, but all of them with periodic orbits. So if you take any rational point inside your toric diagram, you'll get a vector. If you take any rational point, you have a vector with rational coordinates now, plus one. This generates circles inside your torus, and so you have kind of an S1 action, not a free S1 action, but you get a free uh, an S1 action. So you can look at the quotient. And the quotient is an orbifold, a symplectic orbifold. And going back is kind of an orbifold frequentization construct. Okay? And this, <coughs> as, because I'm looking at things with first and class zero, this thing is going, in the context of orbifolds, is going to be a monotone, compact, symplectic toric orbifold. Okay? And these can be classified are in one-to-one -one correspondence, with, which are called with some polytopes, Moment polytopes, I'm talking about here, moment polytopes, not diagrams, the polytopes of the toric, no, this compact synthetic toric orbifolds, which are called R Gorenstein polytopes. And this just means, well, some sort of polytopes such that R times the polytope is reflexive, which is a property well known for polytopes, which is the only integral point inside, it's an integral poly polytope with the only integral point inside being the origin. Moreover, when uh, B is smooth, this R that appears there, it has an interpretation. First of all, let me point out that <clears throat> when B is smooth, we have that the 
Oh, th then you have a, 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 a smooth, compact, uh, toric sympathetic manifold. It is well known that its odd dimensional, odd degree homology is zero. So it only has homo non trivial homologies in even degrees. And then this R turns out to be exactly the, mo the, the first term class is R times omega. So it's monotone, but this monotone constant R is exactly the R that appears here. And moreover, you can also compute the minimal churn number of, of the base in terms of this R in the order of the fundamental group of M. And <clears throat> in this context, a theorem of uh, uh, Bourgeois, I think, I think from Frederic Bourgeois, from I think his thesis, that when the base is smooth, so he proved that the cylindrical contact homology can be obtained as a direct sum of copies of the homology of the base, where the shifting in the degrees has a, a component here that depends on the R. And this R is that minimal, uh, that R that appeared there. Now, what we, the result I wanted to talk about now, in the last minute, is a result that um, kind of generalizes that to, to orbifolds. What happened? And really, this is better illustrated with an example, but so think of this, this is just a result that says that the cylindrical contact homology can, suppose not B is not necessarily smooth. It could be an orbifold base. Obtained as the quotient of any rational rep vector field. Then <coughs> the cylindrical contact homology is, can be obtained again as a direct sum of, for k greater or equal than zero, of copies of the orbifold Shen run or before cohomology of the base, but you have the shifting that you have in the degrees de depends on the twisted sector. So different twisted sectors have different shiftings. So the T here, this number T, parameterizes the, the, the twisted sector. So it's that number between 0 and 1 that gives me the element of finite order in the group S1 that I'm cautioning out. But I'm looking at S1 as the interval 0, 1. And I'm looking at elements here. I'm parameterizing them by these, these numbers in the interval 0, 1. So that enters here. And you also have the R here. And this is the decomposition of the, so these FTs is the decomposition of the orbifold cohomology of the base in terms of these twisted sectors. And these thing, these, these twisted sectors are actually the homology of the isotropy on the base. But again, with these degree shifting numbers. And the thing is that these degree shifting numbers in orbifold cohomology are, again, I said, are tricky to compute. And our degrees of our orbits are also tricky to compute. And the point is that the trick is the same. And so they are complete. You can relate them directly. And that is how the, the, the proof of this goes. You, you do need some work. But the point of the proof, and here is the proof I just want to Look at this, this formula just says the following. The way to compute degrees in the toric degrees of, uh, of closed orbits using our toric machinery, and the way to compute degrees of Shen Ruan cohomology, degree shifting numbers in the quotient, they are related by this formula here. Okay? And once there is a relation that you can see in terms of indices. You can then work, work it out and see what it would translate in terms of the shift of this. So I want to give an example. So there is a corollary that I'm going to skip. It would be a corollary uh, when r is equal to 1, you do get something. But let me go back to this since I'm almost. Yes. I'm almost, but I'll finish. OK. <sighs> Let me get back to this example. So this example we already saw that can be seen as the prequentization of CP. I wrote three there. That's a two. OK, sorry. Of CP2 with, uh, with that uh, class that corresponds to R equals 1. I'm not going to say anything about that. That's a smooth prequentization. But it can also be seen as the prequentization. Oh, by the way, how do you obtain that as a prequentization? Look at the historic diagram. Look, look at the red vector field corresponding to that integral point there in the middle. 0, 0 with last coordinate 1. You quotient. It's a free action. The quotient is CP, CP2. But suppose you change, instead of taking this vector, which is an integral vector, 
take this one, which has coordinates minus 1 half, minus 1 half. So look at the quotient of that length space by the vector induced, the action induced by the vector minus 1 half, minus 1 half, 1. So now the quotient, the quotient is an orbifold, and it turns out that it is a weighted projective space with weights 4, 1, 1. So it has one isolated singularity of order 4, one of the vertices, obviously, and the other two points are smooth. Okay? But now you could apply, let's see what our theorem says in terms of this computation. First of all, you have to compute the twisted sectors, the composition of the orbifold cohomology of CP2411. <clears throat> well, the, the, the twisted sector corresponding to the identity is just the cohomology of CP2. But the others are more interesting. So you have, so four, order four, so you have elements, the element one fourth, two fourths, and three fourths in your group. And these are the twisted sectors, the composition of that. And you see that the degrees change. And the orbifold cohomology that you get is this one. And notice that, for example, the orbifold cohomology of CP2 blown up, uh, not blown up, CP2411, it has non trivial cohomology in odd degrees. So it has a Q in degree one and in degree three. And it's, 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 it's a different type of object from the cohomology of toric sympathetic manifold. And you could not possibly obtain the cylindrical contact homology of the lens space out of shifted copies of these orbifold cohomology. It will never, because it's non lacunary and you need something which is lacunary. But if you do the shifting corresponding to the different shifting for different sectors, that, as the theorem says, you get kind of a very complicated, not very complicated, but a complicated way of computing the same contact that in others. So for example, you have that the, the component of the identity contributes to this, like this. So it's the cohomology of CP2, it's one, 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 but then they shift it by four, so then it repeats, so it contributes like this. But then the others, which are this point, just that singular point, contributes in the twisted sector corresponding to one force like this, two fourths like that, three fourths like that, you see the shifting is different. And then when you add these whole things, you still get one, two, three, 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 as supposed to. Okay? But so it allows you, and the, the, the thing of extend, not all contact manifolds are prequentizations of smooth manifolds, but in the historic setting, all toric contact manifolds are prequentizations of compact toric orbifolds, and if they are C1 equals zero, these guys are monotone, and this applies, okay? So we can apply to these to all that. And uh, <coughs> let me just finish. I'm sorry, I'm completely over time, but um, so just advertising me on a little bit more. Uh, <coughs> so you see, I said that these contact invariants are well defined for sure if our contact toric or our contact toric manifold has a smooth feeling, sympathetic feeling, crepid feeling. It's not always true. It's true in this dimension, but not solely true. But it's always true that e they always have crepent orbifold feelings. So if the techniques, for example, that McLean and Ritter have used to show th that these type of things are well-defined invariants when the feeling is smooth, could be extended when the feeling is an orbifold feeling, then you could prove that, in principle, that these contact invariants, these contact betting numbers are actually contact invariants for all toric contact manifolds. And in that direction, still, uh, let me just tell you what, um, what Miguel Moreira did in his Mathis thesis. So Miguel Moreira in his Mathis thesis, what he did was for some special orbifold, which are global quotients, compact global quotients, he proved that essentially the floor homology, so for general smooth sympathetic manifolds under suitable conditions, which here is Calabi L, so they have C1 equals zero, so it's still a, a very strict uh, context, but the floor homology is the, uh, isomorphic to the usual homology of the, your manifold. And what he showed is in a simple situation for a global quotient but an orbifold quotient, the floor homology is actually the Shandron cohomology of the, of the manifold B for Calabial setting. And still, this is kind of the small Hamiltonians. So this is kind of time-independent small Hamiltonians. You have that. Then you have to prove invariance, you have to do lots of other things, but this was, but still that index relation between degree shifting numbers and index of orbits appears very clear to give a relation of this sort between 
sympathetic, usual sympathetic invariants and ranks of Shen Ruan cohomology group for, for orbifolds. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for going over time.